Hi, this is Anil Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us Rick Myers, VP of Support at uh, Linode. Uh, first of all, thanks for being on the show, Rick. Everything's great. Thanks. Uh, super excited to be here. When I when I think of support, and I'm just trying to share my personal anecdote that I have had with different companies. There was a company, phone company, I don't want to name them. And I used to use their phone and the phone cracked and I asked them, uh, can I have a new phone? They asked me to ship it and they will send it back in 14 days. And then there was another company called Samsung. Their SIM stopped working. I was traveling. I said, hey, I went to T-Mobile and they said, yeah, well, of course you have the, the, the monthly you know, insurance on it. We will take 48 hours and we'll send you a new phone. Uh, and then happened to be a company called Apple. <clears throat> I was going to China for KubeCon and my Mac died. I called them up. They actually called me back on phone. They talked to me to resolve the problem. They could not resolve it. They said, can you bring it to store? I bring it to store and I was flying out next morning at 5 a.m. from IAD. They said, leave the laptop here and we will try to fix it by evening. And at 3 p.m. they called me that your laptop is ready. I drove back again, got my laptop and flew to China next morning. So even if I liked those devices when I bought them, my overall kind of experience with them was so bad because of the support that I received after I bought the device. And the same thing, uh, but when I looked at Apple, my experience actually got better because, you know, things will break no matter what it is, you know. You, 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 uh, but so, so, so at one point, I never actually thought about support to be too critical to my actual experience. But after what I experienced with Apple, it changed my whole mindset. And now I only buy from Apple. And, and actually, when I was buying my new Mac and a Mac Pro, they actually put me on a call with an engineer who also does filmmaking. So he talked to me for an hour to decide what components I should use. And you might be surprised that instead of selling me the most expensive Macs out Mac, He's told me the Mac that would work for my needs. And that was, I mean, like $15,000, $15, not $50,000. So, so it, was, it was not about just trying to sell something. So, so since I'm talking to somebody who does support, so I want to understand from your perspective, what is the importance of, I mean, this is a customer's view that I'm sharing with you. And luckily, <laughs> I have also been in Linode customers. I never have to call your support, which also means that your services are so good that you don't need support. But what is the importance of support for a customers after they have made a purchase either for a product or service? Yeah, you, you, you said the magic word, which was the, the experience. It's the customer experience. So the entire customer experience that, uh, that you need to provide to to your customers is not, it doesn't end at pre-sales, it doesn't end at sales, it doesn't end at the product working, it doesn't end at the product working the way that you want it to, or uh, or the way that you expect. It doesn't end at the support experience. If you have to go down that road, it's it's the entire experience. So um, when, you, when you design all these different components, you need to keep customer experience in mind, uh, and, and none is more important than the other. For example, your experience with Apple, your pre-sales experience was all about the customer experience. Your support experience was all about the experience, the customer experience. And then in the middle, when you're just using your Mac, you're having a delightful experience. So in the back of your mind, your customer experience needs to be the core of everything that you do top to bottom, which, which uh, there's no better example than Apple uh, at doing that really, really well. So now here I'm talking from, you know, customer's point of view, when you look at internally at organizations like Linode or Apple, how do you categorize support where, you know, it's, uh, I have had bad experience where I'll talk to a person and I explain the problem, they will switch me to someone else. I have to explain the problem again. And after they will try to resolve it, it does not resolve. I'll call two days later and I have to explain it again to a new person. So internally, how do you work so that a user get better experience? So do you have some either terminologies or methodologies? Can you talk about that? Yeah, the, the number one thing that we think about when we are designing the experience is about effort. So it's how much effort a customer needs to put into to solving their problem when they reach out to, to a support team. And one of the things that we do um, to, to reduce the effort, one of the most important things we do is, is first update resolutions. 
and no tiered support. So um, there's nothing more frustrating than having to get transferred to a second person or a second tier, having maybe to re-explain your problem, um, having that person not, not be sure of what they need to do, maybe needing to escalate it again. It's just this high effort experience that everyone hates and it, it doesn't make you want to call their support team. It doesn't make you want to put yourself in a situation where you need to call their support team. Hence, you don't buy that company's product anymore. So first update resolutions means getting the problem solved uh, first, first time. So the first time you call, that's when we're gonna solve the problem. Uh, the first time that you email us, the first time we email you back is when we're gonna solve the problem. Uh, and no tiered support means that we never need to escalate your problem to another person. The person that you talk to, the person who opens your email, or the person who picks up the phone is the person who's gonna, who's empowered and able to solve that problem for you. So you're talking about real human beings, but do we live in a world of AI, machine learning and bots. You don't have bots? Correct, yeah. So we have uh, some tools, like we have a, a bunch of self-service options uh, in the name of that being the best experience and the least effort. So if you need to, if you just need to answer a basic question, you shouldn't have to call, right? Like you shouldn't have to open a ticket. So that's where bots and uh, docu really great documentation, really great self-service options exist. Um, but that's low hanging fruit, that stuff's easy. Uh, the rest is 100% human powered support, um, which comes along with all the other benefits, which is that they're humans with feelings and uh, empathy and we know how you feel and we know what you're going through and we can think through things and we've seen other things. So um, yeah, in, in our opinion, there's no other way to go. Yeah, uh, and I think both works better. Yesterday I was activating my card and I was like, no, I'm not going to call a person and explain it to you. But when I log into the system, it was actually automated bot, you know, they're like, oh, if you're activating the card, this is the number and I was done within 30 seconds. So sometimes you don't want to talk to a person too. So it depends on what is the problem you're trying to solve. It's all about that effort. It's all about it's all about lowering the effort that someone needs to, to exert to, to get their problem solved. If it's calling, that's going to be the lowest effort. That's awesome. If it's talking to a bot, that's the lowest effort that's going to solve the problem. So effort is experience. Uh, when we talk about tech companies, we always talk about culture. Uh, but we talk about culture of, you know, contributing back to the society. We talk about culture of, you know, how diverse or inclusive it is. But when it comes to support, because, you know, the, the, the way as we discussed earlier, support is also a kind of, it reflects on your product because that is part of your product. That's part of your experience. So uh, do you also kind of need to have a culture within the company that also look at, hey, this is my customer. It doesn't matter whether they have bought the product or they have, you know, being they should be happy overall. So how much role does culture pay when it comes to support? Oh, it's huge. It's uh, the support team. Uh, we're 24 seven, 365. Uh, we work together really closely. We collaborate on everything we have to because we're a human powered support. Uh, no human knows every answer to every single question. Um, so collaboration is super important to us, uh, which means that we're, we're a pretty tight knit group um, and to have a tight-knit group, you need to have great culture. And to have great culture in your department, you need to have a great culture in, in the company. So from the beginning, uh, support has never been something that... I, I've worked other places where the, the support team were, uh, you know, kind of entry level, uh, jumping off points into other parts of the company. And, and with that, I think just naturally, um, there's a, a certain there's a certain culture difference between maybe a, a, an engineer and the support team or, or someone else in the support team. That's never how it's been at Linode. We, because we understand at the core of everything we do is the customer experience and support is just as important to the customer experience as the product and the pre-sales like we were talking about before. Um, the culture has always been that that support is, is just as empowered and able to to provide to the customer experience as anyone else, which is, which is awesome. And if I'm not wrong, uh, Lenovo does not outsource things. You, uh, because I have been to your headquarters and you know, there are people there in-house 
on uh, uh, in, uh, the location if i'm not wrong is that correct that's correct so my question is that uh, how do you build this kind of you know uh, fabric within your organization what are the core components because as you said pre-sales is there and then their engineering teams are there and also you are also launching new products at the same time you know whether it's kubernetes or chef based product which also means you know uh, you need uh, the people who are offering support to be well versed with those technologies so i just want to understand uh, the internal you know working how do you build this, you know, in a department or organization that is so uh, Apple-like when it comes to support. So it's, it starts at, at recruiting, interviewing, and hiring, I think. So um, we, we pride ourselves on uh, having a really awesome training program for the support team. So everyone who joins us uh, goes through a six-week training um, and then a six, eight, uh, whatever it takes week mentorship after that. Uh, and what that empowered us to do was to change the kind of candidates that we look for. So um, we used to look for people who were both uh, customer centric um, and highly technical uh, because we do something pretty technical and we helped with some pretty specific stuff. Uh, you had to have both of those. Um, we ended up uh, deciding after we couldn't we really couldn't find any more that maybe that wasn't the best approach. And I think that's pretty obvious why. Uh, there's not that many people that have both of those skill sets right out of the box, right? So uh, we developed this tra training program so we could hire people with really great customer service skills and really great customer focus and the aptitude for learning the technical stuff. That empowered us to hire all these really great people, really diverse backgrounds with really great personalities, with um, uh, really great culture, uh, and then train them to do this job. Uh, so that's kind of where that's kind of where it started was uh, through the training program. That's that's where uh, the culture gets infused. You're with a tight group, of six or eight people um, through your training. Uh, then you branch off into mentorship. We also have uh, core values that we live and die by. Um, we have uh, really great internal documentation. Uh, we have uh, all the other supporting elements of, of great culture, but it really starts with um, hiring great candidates and then putting them through uh, a really rigorous, um, complete training program where all that stuff gets reinforced. Uh, can you talk about the core values that you mentioned? Sure, yeah, we have a set of core values that uh, are designed um, because their, their intent is, again, uh, because our jobs are so technical and there's such wide, uh, wide variety of questions that we receive and because there's so much to know, our core values were designed uh, originally to, to tell you how to get to an answer. Um, so if, if you didn't know how to answer a question and whether that's the approach to the question technically or uh, the soft skills that are um, that are required to answer that question. Our core values are all designed that you can go through them and they lead you to exactly how I answer this question. So they they range from everything uh, from, we answer each we first update resolutions, that's in our core values. It ranges all the way from there, all, all the way to things like uh, that we we create the culture that we want to, to have. We come to work every day being better than we were the day before. Uh, and it, it's kind of, our, um, our, our foundation. You mentioned that you know there is a six weeks training uh, when somebody joins, but at the same time you continue to offer new services. You keep adding new product, and then the tech uh, world that we are living in is also kind of you know um, um, uh, uh, a, a dy dynamic you know kind of evolution is happening. People, uh, somebody may have a Linode instance and they are running some serverless instances, you know. So do you also do, uh, do you also continue to update these training programs to, so that, you know, your teams are also updated versus what they learned six years ago is still there? Yeah, 100%. It, it's uh, hard to keep up with. Um, our, our training pro program is all modular, modularized. So uh, you can basically take any piece of our training and pick it out of the training and do a continuing education session. So for example, uh, let's say block storage. We have a module for training for block storage. And every six months of making up numbers or whatever, uh, we'll pick that out and we'll schedule the entire support team to attend a continuing education class for block storage, for example. 
Um, we also have a system on the other end where when we're developing new, um, uh, new products, we use the DRI model, which came from Apple. It's a directly responsible individual. So we have a, a person uh, on our team who's responsible for attending meetings, kind of being the liaison between customer support and the customer and the product teams, um, infusing feedback in both directions, keep every, keeping everyone informed, collecting feedback from customers, uh, informing the customer support team of updates to the product or the progress. Um, at the end of that, process when we launch the product, all the documentation that the DRI has put together in that time now becomes the canonical documentation for that product, which gets turned into the module for the training team. So uh, it's operationalized um, as best as we can uh, and uh, working pretty well, but we're always trying to get better at that for sure. So every time you announce a new service or product, you do kind of retrain your, your, your support team so they are well versed. Perfect. Uh, second thing is that uh, uh, what I was thinking uh, that let, let's say uh, this could be just you know uh, it may not even make sense but if there is an instance where you know I'm talking to a support team and the person cannot answer the question and he or she has to say that we are going to escalate or we are going uh, as you mentioned it never happens but has it ever happened and if it did what lesson you learn and how do you really solve it internally yeah so if something needs to get escalated um, in, in that circumstance, um, there's either a failure of documentation, training, or empowerment. So either uh, someone didn't feel that they could do something for the customer, um, which means that maybe something in our, in our core values wasn't cali isn't calibrated correctly, uh, because a big part of the core values are empowering people to make decisions that uh, that normally would get escalated to someone else, both technically and, and also um, procedurally, or, or uh, something special needs to happen. We try to empower all of our, our support agents to do that. So if it got escalated, it might be because someone was not empowered or enabled to do something, or uh, it's a documentation issue and, and they couldn't find the solution to the problem, or it's a training issue and they just never we never trained on it because it was something that never came up. So each one of those is recapped uh, informally and we see if, if there's a, an opportunity to make sure that that's not escalated moving forward. Now, if I look at all the work that you're doing there when it comes to support alone uh, and compare it to having automated bots or, you know, just outsourcing, it looks like a very expensive endeavor for the company itself. So, so uh, uh, can you talk about, you know, uh, the value that you get out of this kind of support and the investment that you make in, in, in kind of maintaining that module and, and why do you do that? You know, we're, we're, we're privately owned. Um, we don't, we don't, we, we get, have the privilege of, of spending our money how we think it's most important to be spent. And we decided a long time ago that this was the most important way to spend this. Now, that doesn't mean that we go wild and, and uh, just hire you know, hundreds of people all the time. We don't just throw people at the problem. You have to throw efficiencies in there as well. You have to make people's work more efficient. You have to um, make sure that you're not, uh, people aren't opening tickets or aren't getting um, uh, phone calls when they don't need to because they could have gotten it via self-service. Uh, internally, uh, there's so many processes and procedures that, and, and operations that we're always going through that can be more efficient. So you have to tackle it from both sides. Um, we want human power support. We think that that's the most imp important uh, or the best way to do support. So we, ch we choose to invest in that, but you also don't, don't uh, do it irresponsibly on the other end. You, you have to make sure that you're, you're doing, if you're going to make this investment, you better make it the, the wisest investment that you possibly can. So what Linode is doing, you know, the, the zero tier or first tier support, you know, is, is of course, you know, there is great benefit, but there are a lot of other organizations who don't do that. You know, they offer paid support and sometimes they do tiered support where you escalate things. So, so why do they do that? You know, there, is there a logical reason or they just do it because there's nothing better else they can do? Or is there anything that this is better or this is better? Yeah, uh, so we, we consistently re-examine whether or not this is the best thing to do, uh, we are not ignorant to, um, to to looking outside of the box and and and, and reconfirming or or maybe 
rethinking why we do this, but we consistently come back to the conclusion that uh, zero tier support or, and first update resolutions are the best uh, way to do support. For other companies, I, I think they probably just started the other way, you know, as they scaled. Since we did this from the beginning, we knew that as we scaled, that the next, the next step was not to add another tier. It was to figure out how to scale horizontally or how to um, gain efficiencies elsewhere, as opposed to just adding another tier on top. Um, I think it's, I think it's non-traditional thinking, and I, I think that it's probably unnatural for people who have built support organizations in the past. So maybe it's just the natural way to do things. Um, but I, I think if you really examine and want to invest in your people, if you are thinking about the lowest effort um, experiences for your customers, uh, zero tier uh, support is, is the obvious the obvious way to go. Right. I'll just go back to the point that we are talking about, uh, you know, actual uh, support executives that sit there uh, and answer to people's questions. What kind of typical queries that you get because you have a very uh, you know unique market where there are people who are you know just SMBs you know small businesses they just want it they are tech savvy people you know uh, and then they're also individual they just want to run their websites so but what are the typical support questions you get and what do you learn from them to further improve your process in in my opinion I can only speak for myself that this is the most fun part of the job is that um, you don't get you you get a different question that you haven't heard every single day. Uh, so the questions run the gamut from just just billing questions. You know, I don't, I'm not sure I understand this part of my bill, or um, uh, where do I find this thing? All the way to the most technical, the, the most technical things. Um, I, I remember answering tickets, and, and someone would um, open a ticket or or, uh, or phone in, and I I literally had never heard of the thing that they were talking about before. And you have to figure it out. And you have every resource in the world. Um, you have uh, the best resource in the world is the people that you work besides every day. You also have Google, which uh, I guess is pretty good. Um, and uh, you, have to, you have to figure out what's, what's, what this problem is. How do I solve it? How do I diagnose it? How do I troubleshoot it? Um, so yeah, it, it runs the gamut. Um, that being said, to the second point, part of your question, um, if something is is cropping up consistently, or if you're getting the same question in the same category of ticket, uh, that's where we go back to the efficiencies part, right? So that means that maybe our outward facing documentation isn't answering a question, or maybe that our user experience in terms of UI is not uh, intuitive and, and someone can't find something. So that's when things get bubbled up. That's when information gets collected and then internally escalated or taken care of ourselves if we can to, to cut out the most uh, voluminous common questions. And, and that's happening constantly. And that lets uh, makes me curious that we have talked about, you know, a process where, you know, the support people get trained. Now, the, the, the kind of question they get what kind of mechanism you have internally uh, so as to collect feedback from them, uh, which is also, once again, human based or something is automated that, as you said, that the kind of questions you get to further improve. So can you talk quickly about the process that you have uh, that you gather as an organization for the people who are calling you up or sending the ticket? And what is the process? Is it automated? Is it manual to, to make it more efficient? Yeah, there's, uh, there's several. Uh, they sort of depend on channel and they sort of depend on uh, where the end the end point will be. So, um, for example, if it, if it's a product based thing, it might be in a different direction. But it is it is mostly manual at the at the beginning. So, um, we do need to be looking out for oh, this is a feature request, and and the person who's who's talking to the, the customer needs that needs to click with them. That like oh, what they're describing is a feature request because they're not going to say. I have a feature request. Your customer is going to say, oh, I thought that it would be here. And you have to put that together and then be like, oh, maybe there's an opportunity here for us to change how we're doing things. Um, there's also, uh, you know, we have mechanical or automated ways to do things. You know, we, we categorize all of our tickets internally. We quantify all of our tickets internally. We, um, 
we collect metrics about the types of questions that we're getting. We get collect metrics about the amount of things that we're getting, and we're able to to segment them off, break it into a chunk, kind of further examine in that chunk is there a common thread. Um, we have tools that do sentiment analysis and word matching and all that kind of stuff too that that help out. But it's mostly about it's mostly about having your employees recognize that they're part of our job to provide the best customer experience is that you need to be looking for those opportunities and intake them and then put them somewhere however you however you've designated it because no one's no one's going to put that in front of your face and say no one's going to just say like you should move this button to here because it makes more sense you need to collect that because they couldn't find it maybe there's a better place let's think about this so it, it's all it's all in the it's all in, in what you're thinking about. Awesome. Rick, thank you so much for, 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 because this is, support is one aspect that people don't talk about, but that is actually critical because that's how you choose to stay with a company or not, to be honest with you, you know, the, the experience. So, so, so going deep into that and talking about it, I really appreciate your time and I look forward to talking to you again at some point in the future. Thank you. Me too, that was, that was really great. Thanks for having me.